Good morning, everybody, and welcome to First Baptist Church. Yay, hi. <clears throat> hi, everybody. Good morning. Oh, there, you're away. Good. Hey, you people in Facebook, or, uh, fa yeah, Facebook land. Face <laughs> welcome online streamers, too. We're glad everybody is here. It's nice to have you. Come on, wake up. We got to wake up, people. It's, it's okay. It's Sunday morning, not Monday morning. So um, we do have announcements to make today. Um, one is be sure you, in your bulletin, there's the little tear-off uh, leaflet thing, so be sure you uh, uh, register your attendance for us and pop that in the offering plate later on when it comes by. Also be sure you add any special messages or prayer requests you have for Pastor Dan or other leaders in the church. We can communicate that way. Um, if you're not here live but want to communicate, obviously we do have um, ways to message through Facebook or, of course, send an email to Pastor Dan or just give us a call. That works, too. The old telephone thing still happens. All right. Volunteers. We have not had a single volunteer yet for the nursery, and we have a baby who's going to get older and needs somebody to hang out with them in the nursery so mom can still come worship now and again. So would you help mom out a little bit and talk to Stacy or talk to Abby and see if we can't uh, get just a few folks who would be willing to help every now and again in the nursery. You're not committing yourself for every single week for the rest of your life, I promise. It's okay. Just a little bit now and again. Be a grandma. Our business meeting. We have an annual business meeting, and it is today. And what's the message, Mr. Dan, Pastor? Oh, grandpas can also be, yes, yes, grandpas can also help in the nursery. Good point, shame on me. Yes, grandpas, we welcome you as well if you have experience and are willing. Yes. All right. Um, so today we do have an annual business meeting immediately following the morning worship service. We ask that you, uh, we will be asking you to approve our annual budget as well as a slate of officers and other church leaders for this coming year. If you've not received a copy of the annual report, we've got extra copies for you in the rear of the church on the little ledge by the back window. And feel free to pick one up um, and uh, have a little bit of time to glance through that before we do our uh, meeting. On February the 3rd at 6 p.m., we're going to have a movie night. Yes! We're the Christian Ed uh, Committee. We are wanting to host some events off and on throughout this year to help um, invite the community, especially targeting families with young kids, to come and just be a part of our church. And it's not saying they have to be here on Sunday morning, but we're providing events on other times to just help them come and just participate and just be, find a fellowship of people together. And so we're having a community movie night on February the 3rd, which is a Friday night at 6 here at the church in Foles Hall. And so we're going to be showing the movie The Prince of Egypt, which is an animated version of the story of Moses in Egypt. And um, so if you aren't a young family with young children, that's okay. You might know some. Everybody's invited. We'd love to have all of you come as well. But please do me a favor and see if you can invite someone else to come with you, especially if you know some younger people, have some younger family members, have some grandkids of your own who could come and join us and fellowship with us. And let's bring in some uh, additional people for our movie night. We'll be telling you some more about that as it comes up. Um, we're going to go into worship time this morning, and I wanted to share with you just some more thoughts about drawing closer to God, getting to know God better, because in reality, what we know as human beings is a very small, small amount of who God really is, but he invites us to be a part of who he is. He invites us to get to know him better. Let's work on that this year. And so in this new year, would it be amazing if you knew you could spend the whole year being content? Wow. Could anybody possibly live a truly satisfied life? We are bombarded daily with ads trying to convince us that we lack that one thing that only they can sell us, right? Right? 
So we're told all the time, you don't have this, you need this to fulfill who you are. And then when it's not some consumer item, there's still other things that are out there bombarding us saying you're not the, the best, you're not the most beautiful, you're not the most impressive, you're not the most successful, whatever. Trying to say you lack, you lack, you lack. Well, sometimes we do yearn for that something more, that something deeper, maybe something seemingly just out of reach. Jesus knows that we all yearn for something more, more love, more family, more belongings, more approval, more confidence, more satisfaction. And what does Jesus answer for this longing? He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he said, guess what? Those people will be filled. It wasn't a maybe. They will be filled. What does Jesus mean? Can it really be that simple? All we need is Jesus. Well, it's not a trite answer, and it's certainly not a simple answer. The fact is our souls lack satisfaction. The only thing, well, the only one who can fill our souls is Jesus. When you're hungry, your stomach growls. It tells you about it. And you know you want to go eat something. If you ignore to try to fill it with just junk food day after day after day, you're going to get very hungry and eventually get very weak and very ill. But if you fill it with healthy food, your body stays healthy and you grow and you, you stay in good shape. That's something we all know. It works the same way spiritually. When our souls yearn for satisfaction, we feel dissatisfied, we feel a longing. We know we need to feed our inner self. We need to feed our souls. That's the time you don't want to start reaching for junk food. You don't want to start reaching for just the stuff the world has to offer. It's not healthy. It's not going to fill that need. If you keep a steady diet of that junk food, or in just some other way you keep ignoring the hunger and thirst for righteousness, your body, your spiritual soul is going to get weaker and be very ill and be cut off from the true light that comes from God. Instead, we need to feast on the bread of life. We need to learn to drink deep drops from the living water that comes only from Jesus. We need to read the Bible, really study it. Meat and potatoes time here, not just a cute devotion. Those are nice snacks, but we really need to dig into the word and study it. If you're not in a Bible study or a Sunday school lesson, come, be a part of it. Learn from God. Find a lesson to work on at home. There's tons of them out there. Pray. Not just arrow prayers. I'm good at sending those up all day long. But we need to have an intense time on our knees where we just commune with God. So satisfy your innermost places with Jesus in a um, because it is a beneficial way of the glorious covenant relationship that you and I have with God through Jesus Christ. In our call to worship today, we're going to be reading from Psalm 23. Most of us are familiar, very familiar with that. There's a good chance you've even memorized it. As I read it, I want you to think about the great blessings God gives to those who follow him. How he satisfies our souls. I will be reading from the New King James Version. Follow along with me as I read. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not lack anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I lack nothing. I have courage. Your rod and your, uh, let's see, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I will lack nothing. I have God's comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. 
my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I will be satisfied. Praise God. Let's pray to Jesus. Father in heaven, holy God, we just give you praise and honor and glory. For Jesus, you have come to us, not just to tell us some interesting stories, to give us some cool parables to ponder and worry about. You have come to show us true life. You have come to give us the satisfaction we want, we yearn for in our lives, in our hearts, in our souls. Jesus, help us have wisdom by letting your Holy Spirit guide us to learn from you, to feast on your bread, to drink from your living water. For you are life. You are our eternal life. And we give you thanks for the nutrition we can get from you, the spiritual nutrition that we need to grow closer to you, God, to know you better, to walk in your ways, to obey your will, to be filled with your love and to run over and pour it out on everybody around us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, God bless you. The uh, musicians, if you would come forward, we're going to sing some songs together. If you'd like to stand to worship with us, you'd be welcome to, or you can certainly stay seated and still sing. Thanks.
be our prayer, to give you our hearts and our souls, to live for you alone. Lord God, to ask you, please build our lives on you, the firm foundation that will never be shaken. Help us, Lord God, to love each other and to live with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing your love with others around us in a way that glorifies your name. We're not looking for our own pats on the back. We want you, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords to live in glory and honor and praises through what people see in me, what people see in my brothers and sisters here in this room and what are others around who are seeing this and, and worshiping in other churches. Let us learn to glorify you in all we do. I pray that you will lead us and direct us in this rest of this service, Lord God, that we can hear your words, fill our hearts with you, and pour out our love to you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you got your ushers, come on forward and take the offering plate. Heavenly Father, we do love you. And it's out of our, our love that we give back to you this morning, the tithes and offerings, to give to you so that you can give to others to further your kingdom. We ask God that the little bit we give would be a blessing to those around us. Help us, God, through these tithes and offerings to help bring mercy, grace, peace to our neighbors, our friends, to those across the, the country, across the world. Help us to truly be an extension of your love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dimming the lights because we're going to show a, a video clip. And my, I apologize ahead of time, the, the video clip's a little dark, so especially those who are sitting in the back, let me suggest you might want to look over your shoulder to the, the video that will be displayed on the back wall. I think the, um, the quality of the video will be much better. It, it's it's a, a video clip from the, uh, the series called The Chosen. How many of you are familiar with the the chosen. Now, some of you are. It, it's, a, it's a series of stories about Jesus and his ministry and his disciples. And unlike some of the uh, Bible movies that have been done in the past, it, it really didn't try to follow the, uh, the text of the scripture. Instead, what they did, they tried to be complementary to what the scripture said and try to show maybe what was going on for instance, in this, this clip, and what was going on in the disciples' mind when Jesus was sending them out to, to be his apostles. And it, it, it's really important to see the expressions on their face, and that's why I suggest you look over your shoulder what's going on back there, because 
I, I think their reaction to what Jesus is telling them is priceless. You have to remember, these were guys who, for the most part, were just a few months away from being ordinary fishermen. These, these were guys who, who probably didn't fully understand what Jesus was talking about, what he was trying to do, what he was trying to communicate. They were doing their best to just keep their heads above water, and then Jesus came to them with the message that we're going to see in this clip. Would you please? And I have chosen you twelve as my apostles. You're sending us? An apostle is the same as a messenger, one who... I know what it means, Matthew. That's why I'm asking. You are my leaders. And for this mission I have for you, it's best that you spread out and not be concentrated in one place. I... I don't understand. I'm going to go home to Nazareth for a time. And while I'm there, I'm sending you out in every direction, two by two, specifically to our people only. Every direction, Rabbi? Yes, but not to the Gentiles. Not yet. That will come in time. But to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, just as Joshua led the 12 tribes to take the promised land, you will proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And while you are on this mission, you will heal the sick and the lame by anointing them with oil. You will cast out demons. You will cl What? Why are you all looking at me like that? Uh, could, could you just repeat that one more time? <laughs> I'm sending you out two by two, proclaiming as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Uh, how soon are we talking about him? There's that word again. I'll get to that, Simon. Hold on. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. While you are on this mission, I grant you this authority. Someday, you will have it all the time. Was that a ceremony I missed? This is it. Do we feel any different? I don't need you to feel anything to do great things. I understand their feelings, don't you? I mean, can you imagine what it would feel like to, to just be following Jesus around, trying to get some feel for what he's talking about? They, most of the parable just goes right over their heads. They, they don't understand the, the spiritual significance of what he's talking about. They, they mess up right and left. And now he's saying, I send you out as my apostles to preach, to teach, to heal, to cast out demons. I doubt there was a single guy among them that felt even remotely qualified. And that was basically what happened in Luke chapter 9. If you go back and read Luke chapter 9, that's where he sends out the 12 as apostles. But we turned the chapter to, from Luke 9 to Luke 10, and now we're no longer talking about just the 12 disciples being sent out. Now Jesus is talking to 70 or 72, depending on which uh, manuscript you look at, 70 or 72. I, I think the New Living Translation says 72. Now he's sending out a bunch of people to go proclaim, to go teach, to go preach, to go heal, 
to go have authority over demons. And, and if the 12 disciples struggled over this, can you imagine what the 70 or the 72 followers of Jesus were struggling with? Especially when we read the words from Luke chapter 10, verse 3. If they were struggling before with just the concept of being sent out, I'm sure they were struggling as soon as he told them this verse, this line, this, this sentence or two as he was talking to them about what they were to do and experience. Luke 10 verse 3. Now go. And remember that I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Now, even the first part of go, we struggle with that ourselves. You can imagine how they felt. I have to go, I have to leave my job, I have to leave my family, I have to leave my home, I have to leave my comforts, I have to leave my synagogue or their church, if you will. Jesus is telling me to go. And if you read throughout chapter 10, there's not really any good job description here. He doesn't really tell them, all right, I want you to go out for three days. Or I want you to go out for five days. Or, or maybe it's five weeks. Or maybe it's five months. Or maybe it's five years. There's really no definitive answer to how long they were, they were going. And, and can you imagine? Let's put this in our terms. Imagine you're on the nominating committee. And Jesus hands you the assignment of filling the committee for the Lambs Among Wolves assignment. And, and you go to tell people, all right, now I need a volunteer to be a lamb among wolves. And you get this blank look on your face. And you say, oh, don't worry. It's not a long-term commitment because lambs don't last long in front of, in the face of wolves. So this is a, a short-term commitment. You don't have to worry about doing this job for a long time. I don't know of much about lambs and sheep. I know that sheep are basically very vulnerable, and lambs even more so. If you compare a lamb to a little kitten, by comparison, the kitten has a lot more defense mechanism than the lamb does. I don't know if you've ever seen a kitten swell up and start hissing. You know, they arch their back, and they look like oh, they're all of a sudden ten times as big as they used to be. We, we had a dog that, you know, she thought she was kind of tough. And we were walking, the dog was on a leash, fortunately, and we, we came across what I assume was a tomcat. And this tomcat did not run from my dog. This tomcat stood right there, and as the dog started to, to growl and go towards the, the cat, the cat swelled up about ten times its normal size, bared its, its fangs, and started hissing and growling in the it sounded like a mountain lion. It was just quite impressive. And the amazing thing is, my dog all of a sudden had very little interest in this cat. In fact, my dog gave this, this little cat a, a wide berth as he went around and went on his way, or her way, actually. And if, if the hissing and the swelling didn't do the job, if the, the growling didn't do the job, Assuming that the cat did, still had its claws, and I assume it did, had my dog approached the cat, about 20 or 30 quick swats in the nose with its claws probably would have deterred my, my dog. And if, if the swats on the nose did not deter my dog, if my dog was still compelled to chase the cat, well, the cat's very fast, very quick. And, and if the quickness of the cat didn't work out, then there's always a tree it can climb and go way up high and sit up there and, and hiss and growl at my dog. That, that's the self-defense mechanism that God gave to the kittens. But for sheep, if, if, if a little lamb tried to, to swell up and hiss, it would, you know, the, the, the bat just doesn't sound very threatening. And, and when a, a little lamb swells up, it just looks like a, a powder puff. You know, it just, it looks like lunch, to be honest. And the, the sheep is not threatening at all. They can't run fast. They don't have sharp 
claws. They don't have sharp teeth. They don't have a menacing presence. They're basically toast for any wild dog that tries to chase them down, let alone a wolf. And, and Jesus was telling these people who were used to seeing lambs, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. And that's what he's telling the, 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 all of the, the followers of, of Jesus, that he, the, the 70 or 73. If you, if you go back to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, the, the, the job description isn't, even in the, isn't any better than what Jesus told the disciples in Luke chapter 9. He, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily. And that's not talking about wearing the thing around your neck. It's talking about that gruesome symbol of death that every Jew saw as they went up and down the highway, as the Romans were crucifying brutally people dying. You must take your own cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Wow. Lambs among wolves. Take up the cross. Die daily. Give up for God. Part of me, you know, and it sounds sacrilegious, part of me thinks Jesus needed a better PR guy. You know, he doesn't have the whole concept of trying to make people excited about a job or trying to sell things better. You know, you get someone who could, who could maybe tone it down a little bit to make it sound like this is an exciting opportunity instead of a path of death. Can you imagine? Jesus saying, I want you to give up everything. I want you to give up your comfort. We're big on our comforts, aren't we? We like the padded pews. It's a lot better than the old wooden ones we used to have. We, we like the, the lighting. We can all see pretty well in here. Uh, we, we, we like the sound system. Most of us can hear uh, what, what's being said, what's being said from the pulpit, what, what I'm saying, because I've got the fancy little headset deal that catches my, my, my words. We, we, we like our comfort. We like to sing songs that we like. We like to sing songs that come from our generation, not from that other generation. We like to sing songs that are played with the instruments that we enjoy, not the instruments that they enjoy. We like to gather with our friends, sit in our spot. You all have a spot, you know that, right? And if you sit in somebody else's spot, sometimes they look at you funny, like, what are you doing in my spot? You belong over there. You don't belong in my spot. We like our comfort. And Jesus is telling them, I want you, first of all, to go. We don't want to go. We want people to come here. We don't want to leave here. We don't want to go anywhere else. We want maybe to have a better program or something so people come to us. We don't want to go to them. And if we do go, we certainly don't like the whole idea of him sending us into some scary environment where we are vulnerable. Some scary situation where we're not in control. Some scary situation where, well, you get it. Jesus is sending his followers into the scary. And as you read through Luke chapter 10, if you read through chapter 9 where he's talking about the 12 disciples, and then chapter 10 where he's talking about the 72 or 70 disciples, he really doesn't give them a, oh, and by the way, don't worry, you'll be protected by God. He doesn't include that into the, the message. It, it can be implied. In fact, it is implied. It's implied by the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, he is the one who proclaimed God's word from front to back. God proclaimed and inspired the, the word of God so that when we read 
the Old Testament law, we're, we're reading, in fact, the words of Jesus. When we read the Psalms, we're reading, in fact, the words of Jesus that were inspired through King David or the other writers. When we read the, the prophets, we're reading the message that came from Jesus as he breathed the, the message of prophecy through his preachers, teachers, prophets. When we read all of that, we're, we're reading from the heart of God. And so, in fact, when Jesus says this in Luke chapter 10, verse 3, I'm sending you out into the scary. All that comes from the foundation of everything else the Bible says. Do you remember in the, um, the call to worship, 23rd Psalm? Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A lot of us have memorized that in, in Sunday school or in children's church or vacation Bible school. Or maybe you just memorized that on your own because you liked it. But in the middle of that, in verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Jesus was telling them they're going as lambs before wolves. Sheep before the slaughter, and that sounds a lot like the valley of the shadow of death, doesn't it? As we go into the scary, it sounds a lot like going into the valley of the shadow of death where, where there is all kinds of fear, anxiety, wishing that we could go someplace comfortable, but sometimes the, the path of life leads us into the scary. In, in Psalm 23, he says, yeah, even though at times God leads me into the scary, I will fear no evil. Or you might look at that and paraphrase it, paraphrase it and say, I don't have to fear the evil when I go into the scary. When I go into the valley of the shadow of death, whether it's a, a figurative death of a scary place or a literal time of death where, where you are facing the end of your life and mortality is coming to an end, I don't have to fear. Why don't we have to be afraid? Why don't we have to fear when we are lambs in the face of wolves? Why do we not have to, to fear when we are taking up our cross and following him? Why do we not have to fear when our life is coming to an end? What does it say? Oh, come on. For thou art with me. We don't have to fear because God goes with us when he sends us into the scary. We don't have to fear when, when our path becomes scary, when our path of faith, when God asks us to do that thing that's way outside of our comfort zone. You know, we, we don't want to do that kind of thing. God is just not comfortable. We don't, we don't like getting up in front of people. We don't, we don't like teaching or preaching or, or singing God. We don't like doing any of that stuff. We just want to come to church and sit and be comfortable with my friends and go home and have nobody bother me. And Jesus told his followers, go. He didn't say come. The Bible talks about coming and gathering, but the Bible talks a lot about going. Go. And the assumption is as that command comes to his disciples, it comes on the foundation of for thou art with me. God is with us in the scary. God is with us in the bad times. God is with us when, when we are struggling. And it seems like we have no one there for us. God is there 
with us. And then there's the part that always kind of confused me when I was a kid. It says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I, I don't know if you've ever had someone use a rod of discipline on you. There was nothing really comforting about that as a child. Even if it just happened to be a belt instead of a rod or maybe a switch. There's nothing particularly comforting about that. I can understand the staff. You know, the staff is, is, in essence, a comforting piece of equipment for a shepherd. If, if a, a sheep is heading the wrong way, you can take the, the end of the staff and kind of gently nudge them to the side. And if they don't get it, you can give them a little less gently. But, but it's not really, unless you're a trained martial artist or something, it's not really a weapon as such. Now, this end of it, the hook is, is kind of handy. If some sheep gets falls in a ditch or something, you reach down, you can hook them and bring them to safety. You can help keep them out of danger. You can pick them up and bring them to safety. So this, obviously, I, I can see this as being a comfort to know that my Lord, who loves me, has a staff. He's kind of leading and guiding me gently. And when I mess up, he's there to bail me out and get me to safety. So I, I, I really dig this image of God. Some of you asked me about the billy club this morning. How many feel comforted by a billy club in my hands? Had some say, is that what you're going to do to keep us awake this morning, Pastor? If we, if we uh, doze off, you're going to come and kind of gently wake us up? Now, that's not the point of the shepherd's rod. See, while, while the shepherd may never use this thing to ward off a wolf, this could be pretty handy. If a wolf or a mountain lion or a bear or, or whatever comes after the sheep, a wild dog, It'd be kind of handy to have one of these. And whether you're a police officer or you've been trained in martial arts or you just played baseball as a kid, you know what to do with one of these, right? I mean, it's it's pretty effective. Extension of your arm gives you a little additional length. There's some weight. And if if you have a pretty good swing on it, it can come down with quite a bit of force. And and it's a hard wood. And so it's not easy to break. And, and the, the shepherds were really good at these because they practiced a lot. If, if the, the wolf was out of range, no big deal. They could throw it. And so it made a pretty effective weapon. It did Whether the wolf was here or the wolf was over there, they could nail him with this thing. And as a helpless sheep, it's comforting to know the shepherd's got this thing in his hand or under his belt or wherever. And he can protect you with the rod of protection. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And the image for me is that God is there protecting. God is there guiding. God is there with us, for us, each day of our life. And especially when we respond to God's strong suggestion that we go. That we go and follow his path. His strong suggestion that we we go proclaim the mercy, the grace, the joy of God to those around us. We don't have to worry about getting eaten alive as vulnerable lambs. We don't have to worry about not being smart enough not knowing enough about the Bible, not having the clue of what we're supposed to do if we, in obedience, go and talk to those around us, tell them about God's love, help share what God has done in our life and and show this is what God can do for you. If we will but follow His instruction to go and share. And we're not just talking about the, the ordained pastors here, which you might consider the 12 disciples to be the ordained pastors. That, that was Luke chapter 9. But Luke chapter 10, we're talking about just normal people. 70 of them. 
So you look around here, that would be everybody in this room right now. Every one of us. God could have called us together and said, I'm sending you out. All 70. You're all called. Go. Go. It's a threatening, uncomfortable prospect. The thought of not just coming and sitting, being entertained, having a riveting sermon. Eh, maybe one that's not so riveting. To actually take what God shares in our hearts here and go out there with what God shares with us in here, out into the scary. See, that's what Jesus was telling the 70 or the 72. And as you read through the Bible, I think we find that's what Jesus tells all of us. Go into all the world. Go out there. Share his love, share his grace, share his mercy. Because he will be with us always, even to the end of the world. Are you facing some scary this week? Hang on to God. God will be with you. God will protect you. God will enable you. God will give you strength. Let's look to God in prayer. Take a few moments of silence and let the Holy Spirit speak to you yet again this morning. So God, we thank you for your promise. We thank you for this message. God, I thank you that you continue to work in our hearts, even when I quit and say amen, your Holy Spirit continues to work in each of us. Help us, God, to say yes. Help us to say yes. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If the musicians would come and lead us in our closing uh, song. Uh, a reminder, we do have our business meeting immediately after uh, the worship service. If you're not a member, you're welcome to stay. It won't be a very long service, uh, but let's stand together as we sing our closing song.
receive the benediction from our Lord in Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord be good to you and give you his peace. Go in his peace. Amen. Alan?